Well, good morning. For those of you who haven't heard me before, you'll notice that I uh, don't have a uh, American accent. <laughs> I have a deep southern accent. So from very deep southern, right, from, from down under. My wife and I came over to America actually uh, 22 years ago and we still try to maintain our Australian accent. We're with an organisation called Answers in Genesis. It's an organisation to teach people how to defend the faith uh, in today's world. And Memorial Day weekend last year, we opened a creation museum in the greater Cincinnati area, the only one of its kind in the world. And this particular museum, 70,000 square feet, is actually more of a walk through the Bible. It's a walk through the Bible answering the questions of the age with animatronic dinosaurs, with live animal displays, a Digistar projection system, the planetarium, a special effects theater, just like Universal Studios, where the seats vibrate, blue water and air on you, and that sort of thing. And you'll walk through the whole Bible, experience it. Needs to, need to take a whole day, basically, and walk through Noah's Ark and then see our two-story uh, dinosaur exhibit. We present the gospel based in real history. We have outside waterfalls, beautiful gardens, dinosaur topiary, petting zoo with a zorse and a zonkey and other interesting creatures. See, they're, they're all part of the horse kind. Noah didn't need zebras and horses and donkeys and all the different types of horses on the ark, and he needed two horses. So see, there's good teaching in all of that. So I trust you can come uh, to the Creation Museum. You can find out a lot more about that, about that from the AnswersInGenesis.org uh, website. What I wanted to do today was this. It is the year of Darwin, so to speak. 200th anniversary of his birth this month and later on in the year the 150th anniversary of the origin of the species and the Darwinists, the secularists are pushing Darwin like never before around the world. And we also look at this nation of America and we realize that this nation of America has greatly changed, hasn't it? In fact, I believe it's on the verge of massive change in many ways. Not just economically, I'm talking about morally. And there's a verse of scripture I want us to remember the, today, and it's this one from 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. It comes from one of those genealogies. Some of the times, those passages, we don't like to read them unless we want to go to sleep. But in here, we get this little gem of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times. They had understanding it was the time for David to be king. But I want to apply it this way for us today. Do we have understanding of the times in America? Do we really know what's going on? I mean, do you realize America has been the greatest Christian nation on earth? Even right now, you have more churches, seminaries, Bible colleges, Christian colleges, Christian bookstores, Christian resources, Christian radio, TV, than any other nation in the world. You have right now more Christian resources than you've ever had in your history. Millions are worshiping in churches like this all across America today. But for all of that, let me ask you a question. Is America as a culture becoming more Christian or less Christian every day? And what would you say? Less Christian. So there is something wrong. Why is not the church touching the culture? Why do we see these moral issues pervading this nation like never before? Who would have thought 50 years ago you'd have the issue of abortion and gay marriage and nativity scenes and Ten Commandments being thrown out of public places? Who would have thought the Bible would by and large be eliminated from public schools, that God would be thrown out of the science classes? This nation has changed. A humanist group put an ad in the Washington Post newspaper recently congratulating President Obama and putting one of his quotes from his autobiography that he wrote before the election. And he said this, whatever we once were, we are no longer just a Christian nation. We are a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, a nation of non-believers. Pretty sad, isn't it? But America is no longer a Christian nation. And sad when the president, the leader of this nation, actually says we are no longer a Christian nation. And you know, you see all sorts of things happening in the church. For instance, 95% of kids from church homes go to public schools in America. That's 95% of your kids, your grandkids. And you know, George Varner in his research indicates of those kids from church homes that go to public schools, 70% at least will walk away from the church. Does that concern you when you think of your kids, your grandkids? Varner also said that a, in a new study conducted among 16 to 29 year olds, a new generation is more skeptical and resistant to Christianity than were people the same age just a decade ago. And that's what we're finding, isn't it? And so we have to ask ourselves, why is not the church touching the culture like it has in the past? Because the culture actually invaded the church. You know, in John 3, in verse 12, Jesus, in the context of talking to Nicodemus, said, Nicodemus, if you don't believe the earthly things, how can you believe the heavenly things? I want to apply that in a particular way here this morning. 
If you don't believe the earthly things in the Bible in Genesis 1 to 11, how can you believe the spiritual things, the heavenly things that are based in those earthly things? In 1 Peter 3.15, we're told, always be prepared to give an answer or defense. That word comes from a Greek word, apologia, from which we get our word apologetics. Answers in Genesis, an apologetics organization teaching how to logically defend the Christian faith against the skeptical questions of this age, against the Darwinists, the secularists who tell us that the Bible's history in Genesis is not true. By the way, do you know what's missing from most of our church homes and churches? Most of us are not teaching apologetics. Have we really trained our kids to answer the skeptical questions of this age? Are we training them in church to do that or do we just impose Christianity upon them? I suggest one of the big factors causing many of our young people to walk away from the church today is that they have not been taught how to defend the Christian faith. They haven't been given answers because many of us don't know what to do with those questions. How did Noah get the animals on the ark? Where did Cain get his wife? What about the races? What do you do with dinosaurs? What about carbon dating? What about the Big Bang? You know, for many of us, we say, well, that doesn't matter, you know, as long as God did it. <laughs> what about this? It does matter because it's what God said he did that's important. Because, you see, this is the authoritative Word of God. And if we can't trust it in its earthly things in Genesis 1 to 11, which is really the application of John 3 verse 12 today, how can we trust the rest? You see, when you read Genesis 1 to 11, you actually read the history of the universe, the biological history, the geological history, the anthropological history, the astronomical history. But you realize that history, which includes the history of the creation of man, the fall of man, the entrance of sin, the entrance of death, it's all foundational to the rest of the Bible. It's foundational to the gospel. It's foundational to every doctrine. But we live in an era of history in which through the public schools and the Learning Channel, Discovery Channel, whatever it is, we have secularists who, who are permeating this, this culture with the idea that no geology, billions of years, that, that totally destroys Genesis. No biology, no evolution is true. One kind of animal changed into another. Anthropology, no ape-like creatures turn into people. No, Genesis is definitely not true. Astronomy, no, the Big Bang, the sun came before the earth. The Bible says the earth came before the sun. The Bible got it wrong. That's what they say. Do you realize that's what generations of our kids are being taught? Is it any wonder that we find a problem? Because if they're being taught, you can't trust the first part of the Bible in Genesis, and that's what most of them are being taught, why will they trust the rest? Because, you know, the message of Jesus and the resurrection actually comes from this book. And we get that message because we take these words as written. That's why we believe the account of the feeding of the 5,000. Or we believe about Jonah being swallowed by a fish because we take these words as written. Genesis is written as history, and yet most of the church doesn't take them Genesis as written. Most of the church is compromised with millions of years, big bang. Most of us don't know how to answer the questions. Most of us say, look, that doesn't matter, but Johnny, trust in Jesus anyway. You see, we need to understand something. That account in Genesis is foundational to the whole of the rest of the Bible. If it's not true, how can the rest be true? When Jesus, who's the truth, who's the creator, quotes from Genesis in Matthew 19 when asked about divorce, it concerned marriage, and if Jesus believes Genesis, I'm going to believe Genesis. He quoted his history. You know what he said? Have you not read? Can I put that in a modern context for you? Here's what he would say today. Haven't you read your Bibles? <laughs> Haven't you read Genesis 1 to 11? You know what it says there? God made male and female, not male and male, male and female. And he said, this is the reason a man leaves his father and mother, cleaves unto his wife, they'll be one flesh, quoting from Genesis 2. He was showing that the doctrine of marriage is dependent upon that history being true. That marriage is one man for one woman because Genesis is true. But if you teach whole generations that Genesis is not true, that they're a product of evolution, you can't trust Genesis 1 to 11, the Bible's not the absolute authority, what's marriage? Whatever you want to make it to be. Is it any wonder we have a problem? By the way, do you realize it's not just marriage? Do you realize ultimately every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11? Here's much of the church saying Genesis 1 to 11 doesn't matter, it's not important. Wait a minute, why are we sinners? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is there death in the world? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do you wear clothes? I see you are. That's good. Why? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we need a new heavens and new earth? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven-day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is Jesus called the last Adam? Genesis 1 to 11. Why did he die on the cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Do you think Genesis 1 to 11 is important? 
It's a foundational history for the whole of the Bible, for our doctrines. And people, here's the thing. When you doubt Genesis 1 to 11, or you tell your children they don't have to believe Genesis 1 to 11, or you as a church say we don't take a stand on Genesis 1 to 11, you do two things. One, you undermine the history that's foundational to all doctrine. But secondly, when you don't believe Genesis 1 to 11 because you say it could be millions of years, evolution, maybe God used evolution, maybe God used the Big Bang, that's not what Genesis 1 to 11 says. You reinterpret the clear words. You're undermining the authority of the word itself. And that's the issue because we don't say, do we, in, in, in a conservative church who believe that you need to be born again, who believe in the resurrection of Jesus, do we say, well, science has never shown that man can rise from the dead, so we better reinterpret that. Science has never shown that there can be a virgin birth, so we better reinterpret that. We say, oh, no, you have to take that as written. Over here in Genesis, as written, it says six days, global flood, and so on. We say, oh, we can reinterpret that. We can add in the millions of years. Evolution, you have just undermined the authority of the word itself. And you see, that's the problem. We have generations in our church today. Most of our kids go to public schools where they're taught the Bible's not true, Genesis is not true. Man evolved, big bang, billions of years, and they're asking questions. And the question they're asking is, can the Bible really be trusted? What's the church going to say about this? And you know what much of the church says? Much of the church says, oh, don't worry about that. Trust in Jesus. By the way, we want people to trust in Jesus. But the message of Jesus comes from the same book as Genesis 1 to 11. And if you can't trust that history in Genesis 1 to 11, if that history is not true, then eventually don't be surprised if they give up the rest. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of people come to me and they say, are you saying you've got to believe in six literal days and a young earth and, and you can't believe in the Big Bang because otherwise you can't be saved? Is that what I said? I didn't say that. What does the Bible say? It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead and reject evolution and believe in a young earth, you'll be saved. <laughs> Is that what the Bible says? No, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's faith in Christ that saves you. It's not tied to, the, to a young earth. And people say, oh, so it doesn't matter about the millions of years. I didn't say that. It does matter. It doesn't affect your salvation if you believe in millions of years as a Christian, but you know what it does affect? How your children and others then view the authority of Scripture from which you get the message of salvation. That's the issue. And when you unlock that door to say you don't have to take it as written, don't be surprised if they push that door open through the rest of Scripture. In fact, we did some research with America's Research Group. It's coming out in a book in two months. The book will be called Already Gone. We researched those people who used to go to church regularly as kids but no longer go to church. They're aged 20 to 29. And the people who are interviewed, we make sure that only those from conservative churches actually went through uh, this particular survey because that means it's much worse in the general church. People, I want to show you just a little brief look at what we found because you know what we found? Most of the young people sitting in our churches in America today are already gone. You see, we asked, first of all, what school they went to. Most kids from church homes go to public schools. 90 to 95% go to public schools. That's not surprising. That's the general statistic. If you don't believe the Bible, when did you first heart start to have doubts? Do you know what many people say when I ask them? When do you think kids' faith really gets attacked? Oh, college. That's what we think. Oh, by the time, time our kids get through high school, oh, they're going to college. We better prepare them for college. They're going get, to get attacked. Most of them are already gone. You can't deny these statistics. It's only 10% in college. If you don't have them by the end of middle school, you don't have 40% of them. If you don't have them by the end of high school, you don't have about 44% of them. You don't have them by the end of high school, you don't have nearly 90% of them. They're already gone. At what age did you begin to really question contents in the Bible? People, even kindergarten kids, watch TV and they see cartoons and they hear millions of years and they watch other channels and they hear millions of years, millions of years. They've already got those doubts. And what do we do? We don't answer them. We say, well, don't worry about that. I don't know. I don't want to do with dinosaurs. You can believe in millions of years, but, 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 but Billy, Billy, trust in Jesus. And they're already gone because we haven't defended our faith and given them answers. Would you say questioning was the beginning of your doubt in the Bible? Oh, questioning. 
How many times have our kids come to us? Mum and Dad, what about evolution? What about millions of years? Dinosaurs. Or they come to, to a church, pastor, what about... The, oh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Look, you can, as long as God did it, big bang, billions of years, doesn't matter. They're gone. They're already gone. Because what we've really said is, God's word doesn't matter over here. Oh, it does matter over here, but it doesn't really matter over here. They're already gone. Another statistic, which was really a shocking one, which I have to be real careful about what I say about it, it involves Sunday schools. But I think it applies across the church. We divided them into those groups that went to Sunday school regularly as kids and those that didn't. And we found some shocking statistics, which you can't deny. Before I say that, I am not advocating getting rid of Sunday schools. I am advocating some radical changes. And this is not true of every church, obviously. But it's generally speaking, this is what the statistics bear out. It was thrilling to come here to this church and walk into the Sunday school area and they've got the Garden of Eden and dinosaurs in the Garden of Eden. Do you know how many churches would have that in America? You could probably count them on the fingers of your left foot. It's not many. It's very few. But do you know what we found by and large? Sunday school is detrimental to a children's spiritual health. Those that went to Sunday school by and large are worse off than those that didn't. Give you a couple of results. Those that went to Sunday school regularly as kids are more likely to defend abortion than those that didn't. Those that went to Sunday school regularly as kids are more likely to defend premarital sex than those that didn't. We go right down the line with a lot of questions like this. It will blow you out of the water. You say, why? Look well, at this statistic. Which of these do you question the Bible the most? For those that go to Sunday school regularly as kids, these people that have already left church, notice the age of the earth is a big issue. Oh, I find that all across America. So many pastors, they might not believe in evolution, but millions of years, you've got to believe in millions of years. These people are saying this was the biggest issue. Caused them to doubt the scriptures. You know, those that didn't go to Sunday school regularly as kids, it's still a big issue, but not as big an issue. Why is that? You know what I think it is? Because I think in the majority of instances, a lot of our Sunday school teachers, volunteers, dedicated people, I, I applaud you, but a lot of them don't know how to answer the questions of this age. A lot of them haven't even been trained as teachers. And when the kids come from the public schools into their Sunday school classes, what about millions of years dinosaurs? They hear an authority figure say to them from the church, it doesn't matter, you can believe in millions of years. Because I'm telling you, 30 years experience, the majority of Christian leaders in this nation, the majority of people in our churches will not take a stand on a literal genesis. It is a major problem in the church. And see, there's another issue, it's the curriculum itself. Most of our curricula teaches what I call Bible stories. It doesn't teach them how to defend their faith and connect the Bible to reality. You know what I mean? Jonah and the great fish, feeding the 5,000, Adam and Eve, Noah and the ark, and you say, and Jesus on the cross. But you believe those, yeah. What's wrong with that? It's the way it's taught. If I went to the average Sunday school teacher, youth group leader, college group leader, whatever, and said, okay, Mary, you teach Sunday school. In Sunday school, do you teach geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology? What would her answer be? No. And then if I said, Okay, Mary, well, where do kids go to learn about geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology? I want you to call out your answer. They go to? Oh, they go to school. See, you knew the answer. That's what we think, don't we? Oh, it's school where they learn about this stuff. It's school where they learn about the geological history of millions of years, the biological history of evolution, the astronomical history of the Big Bang in billions of years, the anthropological history of evolution. Oh, they go to school to learn about dinosaurs and fossils. We don't do that at church. You know why? Because we gave up the earthly things because we didn't know what to do with Genesis. We didn't know what to do with the millions of years. Instead of standing on God's Word, we gave it up. And you know what we do? We teach Bible stories. And yet at school, they think, we learn real history at school. And they come along to church, and it's, this is not relevant. It's not really real. The Bible's not real. It's just a book of spiritual things, moral things. School makes it real, and they walk away from the church. They're already gone. Now, let me give you a practical example to help us understand here what's happening. 1 Peter 3.15 says, be ready to give an answer. Apologetics teaching is missing from our curricula. It's missing from our churches, our Sunday schools today. And our kids are already gone, by and large. See, I had a lady said to me, well, you'd like our Sunday school material because we teach Noah's flood was a global event. It really happened, and the animals and Noah went on the ark. <laughs> and they came off the ark after the flood. And we tell them it really happened. Isn't that great? I said, you've got a problem. Why? Because that just comes across as a story. What do you mean? Let me ask you this morning. 
How many of you have heard the accusation from the world that Noah couldn't fit all the animals on the ark? Put your hand up. Oh, my, 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 what a surprise. Our hands go up. Because isn't that one of the skeptical questions of this age? How can Noah fit the animals on the ark? And you know what we say to kids? Well, I don't know. Don't worry about that. Trust in Jesus, Johnny. Are we giving them the answers, equipping them ready for the attacks that are going to occur out there? The attacks that have already happened. Most of our kids' books, if we're really honest, in our churches and our Sunday schools, and I've been into churches where you go into their Sunday schools and on their walls, in their books, you see Noah's Ark looking like an overloaded bathtub with giraffe sticking out the chimney about to sink at any moment. And we say, isn't that cute? Our kindergarten kids love this cute little ark. It's cute, but it's dangerous. You know why? Noah's Ark didn't look like that. The world scoffs at Noah's Ark. Why help them scoff and make it look like a fairy tale? Noah couldn't have fit the animals on that ark. That just reinforces it. And there's never any dinosaurs on it. It just reinforces it's a fairy tale. Oh, it's cute. It's dangerous. Why not make Noah's Ark look like it really looked? A real boat. Wow. In fact, I want to tell you, it's the wrong question to ask, how did Noah get the animals on the ark? The right question is, why did he build a boat so big he didn't need? It's true. There's plenty of room on Noah's Ark when the animals are on board. See, what a difference it would make if we taught our kids, you know, if you look at dogs, you can have dingoes and wolves and coyotes and jackal and fennets and foxes and, you know, there's all our domestic varieties of dogs and even poodles are dogs, that's true, we can allow that. <laughs> We've got all these dog variations. How many dogs did Noah need on the Ark? He didn't need all those species of dogs, he just needed two. But isn't that evolution? Oh, they're taught that at school, but that's not evolution. You know why, Johnny? They were dogs, are dogs, will be dogs. That's not evolution, that is dogs. Two dogs come off Noah's Ark because of the incredible genetic variability God already put in their genes as they increase on the earth and split up from each other. Different combinations survive better in different areas. That's called natural selection, adaptation, which Darwin was right about. He was wrong that it causes one kind of animal to change into another. It's just a sorting out of the information that's already there. Oh, he, he only needed two dogs and two elephants, and, and so it goes on. Well, he didn't need the, all the room that he had. That's right. Why did he build a boat so big? Because God is a gracious God, and people could have gone on that ark to be saved. Do we connect the, 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 the flood to fossils, connect it to geology? If there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Surprisingly, that's what you find. Actually, it's not surprising. You'd expect that. Dead things? Dead things. Ah, remember this, though. When God first made everything, the animals and man were vegetarian. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. That's true. It wasn't until after the flood God said, just as I gave you the plants, now I give you everything, which is why you can eat a hot dog. <laughs> everything. It's the only place a hot dog is mentioned in the Bible, by the way. See, even a hot dog goes back to Genesis. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Why did God change our diet? Because sin changed everything. Adam, you can eat of all the trees. There's one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely what? Die. Adam rebelled. Death came into the world. Very important. The Bible says death is an enemy. If you believe in millions of years, as many people in the church do, or even evolution, then you've got millions of years of death before Adam sinned. Not just death, but in the fossil record, there's evidence of animals eating each other. How could that have happened before Adam's sin when they were vegetarian to start with? There's evidence of diseases in the fossil record, like cancer. How could God call that very good? There's evidence of thorns in the fossil record, said to be hundreds of millions of years old. The Bible says thorns came after the curse. You cannot have millions of years of fossils before Adam sinned. The fossil record has to come after sin. These two things here, death before man, death after man, cannot be true at the same time. Either the Bible's wrong or, or what man is telling us is wrong. And it's not the Bible that's wrong. See, the Bible tells us that the whole of creation groans because of sin. If there was millions of years of death and struggle before sin, it's not groaning because of sin. It's always been groaning, but it's because of sin it groans. 
That's why there's a 9-11. That's why people die. Or there's a tsunami or hurricane that kill people. What a difference when our children grow up being able to connect the flood to the fossils, being able to connect, uh, answer questions about how Noah could fit the animals on the ark, connect it to biology, understand that death is in the world because we sinned. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. What a difference that's going to make in their lives and in the way they witness to others. See, and even connecting it to geology. I've been to the Grand Canyon Stood there with a park ranger, he said, a long time and a little bit of water did this. And I stood there and said, a lot of water and a little bit of time did this. Because, <laughs> see, I believe in the flood. Those layers are full of dead things. They couldn't have formed before sin. When our kids were there, we didn't teach them millions of years. We said, they're full of dead things. It had to come after sin. And we talked about the flood. You'd expect billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth, which is what you see, by the way. And you know, when you go to the Grand Canyon, there's all sorts of other exciting things. Oh, we could do so much. We could spend millions of years talking about this. I just love this topic. You know, when you go to the, the Grand Canyon, you go up the Kaibab Plateau. It's been raised up. You know, what, you know what the Bible indicates in Psalm 104, how God ended the flood? Raised up the mountains, sank the ocean basins, the water poured off into the oceans. And when you go to where it was lifted up, and you look at the size of those people down there, Wow, look at this here. Do you know when you look at that area, it was bent when it was soft. It couldn't have been bent after millions of years of consolidation because then the sedimentary rock would have been basically turned into metamorphic type rock, but it's still sedimentary rock. And when you look at the grains, they weren't pulled apart or anything. That was bent when it was soft. It all fits with what the Bible says. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? You know, when Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18th, 1980, hundreds of feet of sedimentary layers were laid down. Canyons were formed quickly. Incredible catastrophism. Look, we're going to watch a video. We're going to roll a video that will help you see the sorts of things that can happen. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons, canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. and vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade, similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. See, that's the sort of thing we need to be doing in our Sunday schools, in our youth groups, in our college groups, connecting the Bible to the real world. That's just one of many of the videos we show, by the way, at our Creation Museum. And you know, to teach even things like this, most people have the idea it takes millions of years to make fossils. Well, it doesn't. Here's one of my favorite fossils. 
It's no relation of mine, but somebody left a ham on a table in a village in New Zealand, it was covered by volcanic ash, dug it out, and the ham had petrified. People think it takes millions of years to make rock. I had a student once jump up in, in, in a class over in Spain, and he said to me, but everyone knows it takes millions of years to form rock. Can you give an example of rock forming quickly? I said, well, you ever heard of concrete? It doesn't take millions of years to form rock. That's why you find even things like this, a spark plug in a rock off the coast of Ventura. It wasn't used by some ape man in his chariot millions of years ago or anything like that. See, the point I want to make to us is, can, can you imagine what would happen if we started teaching our children how to defend their faith, giving them answers, helping them understand that God's word is true from the beginning and they understood the Bible is the absolute authority? Man, they'd believe marriage is one man for one woman. They'd understand that abortion was wrong. They'd understand that God's word is true and we've got to get out there and preach the gospel with authority because we're sinners in need of salvation. What a difference it would make. You know, Peter tells us in the last days, the philosophy of the age will be that things have gone on and on since the beginning. The philosophy of this, philosophy of this age is things have gone on and on for millions of years. And you know what Peter says? In the last days, people are going to reject creation and they will reject the flood of Noah's day. The philosophy of this age is there never was a global flood. God didn't create. And even though in much of our churches we would say, well, God did create, we do not believe the creation account in his word as we should. And here's the point. See, if God's word is true and God's word is the absolute authority, who determines right and wrong? God, good and bad. God. If there's no absolute authority, like in the book of Judges, when there was no king to tell them what to do, they all did what was right in their own eyes. That's, that's what's happening today. We have whole generations. Most of our kids and grandkids in our churches being taught in a public school system where they're throwing God, the Bible, prayer out. I know there are some teachers who are missionaries in that system that need our prayers. But by and large, they're being told everything happened by natural processes. You're just an animal. If I'm just an animal, why can't I do what is right in my own eyes? What does it matter what I do to another animal in my class? Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? You see, the reason we believe in right and wrong, marriage, one man for one woman, is not because it's an opinion or because our founding fathers might have believed that. It's because God's word is true and Genesis is true. But the more people are taught, no, man's a result of natural processes. Why not write your own rules? Do what you want with sex. Marriage, whatever you want to make it to be. Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. We're all animals after all. You see, people, we see the collapse of Christian morality in this nation, the collapse of Christianity. We see moral relativism pervading the culture. You know why? There's been a change foundationally that's occurred in government, in, in, in courts, it's occurred in the public schools, and it's occurred in the church. It's a change from God's word to man's word. Oh, yeah, in church, you might open up the Bible, but when you have made man the authority over the first part of the Bible and reinterpreted Genesis, you have changed that foundation from God's word to man's word. Don't be surprised if the kids in your church do the same then in Genesis, do the same as what you've done there with morality. Why not? Why not make man the authority in regard to marriage? I'd like to sum it up this way with these two castle diagrams. Here we have the foundation of God's word, the castle of, secular human, the castle of Christianity and the doctrines of Christianity, foundation of autonomous human reason, secular humanism, a moral relativism here. There's been an attack in this age on the authority of God's word, attack on the gospel, attack on Christianity. It actually was an attack in Genesis. Much of the church said, well, Genesis is not important. You know what we're really saying? God's word is not important there. What do you think God thinks about that? I'll, I'll accept the rest of the Bible. That's okay. And we'll, we want this structure. We want, we want kids to trust in Jesus. People, that structure needs that whole foundation or it'll collapse. And then we look up here and say, oh, look at all the problems in the culture, abortion, uh, gay marriage, the problems. They're not problems, they're symptoms. That doesn't mean we shouldn't stand against the, these, these things that are wrong. But you see, millions and millions of dollars of Christians' money in America has been spent trying to change the culture, change those moral issues. The Bible doesn't say go into all the world and change the culture. The Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Here's the point I want to make to us. The reason the culture changed is because hearts and minds changed in regard to the Word of God. We've taken whole generations from our churches through an education system and changed their foundation from God's Word to man's Word. Now they have a different worldview. They're sitting in our pulpit. They're sitting in our, in, in our churches. They're sitting in our pews, and they're already gone. And where we keep trying to change the culture. Do you know how you change a culture? 
you get out there and you stand upon the authority of God's word and you preach the gospel and you answer the questions of the age you do what the Bible tells you to do and you raise up a generation who know how to stand on the foundation of God's word you raise up a generation for which we have restored that foundation of the authority of the word trained to be able to answer the skeptical questions of this age and know when they go and preach the message of the gospel they can preach with authority because they believe the book which it comes from they know why they believe marriage is one man for one woman it's not just an opinion it's because God's word is true because God is the absolute authority they know why abortion is wrong because God's word is true they can preach with authority and see hearts and minds changed and that's what changes a culture you know, the point is, the culture changed from the foundation up, and many of us in the church have tried to change it back from the top down. You can't change it from the top down when it changed from the foundation up, but the same is true of our own children. And I want to leave us with a challenge here this morning. The challenge is this. It's really a challenge centered around the flood of Noah's day, because it was a pivotal event in history, a pivotal event. Do you know, in the time of Noah, when he was on board, the animals were on board, do you realize something? That ark stood for seven days before the flood. You ever wondered why? You know what the Bible says, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Do you know what I think Noah was doing? People, God's word is true. He said there's a flood coming. There's a flood coming. It's a global flood. He's provided an ark of salvation. There's plenty of room. Only two of every kind, seven of some are on board, and there's plenty of room. Come on board the ark to be saved. You know what I think the people did? Silly old Noah. Fancy believing God's word. We don't believe God's word. We don't have to take God's word as given. We can reinterpret it. And then the door shut. And it's too late. You know, when Jesus stepped into human history as the babe in a manger, you know what Jesus said? When he was walking the earth as the God-man, he said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he'll be saved. Because Adam sinned, and we're all descendants of Adam, we're sinners, we're alienated from God, Jesus stepped in to be the new Adam, called the last Adam, to take the place of the first Adam, to die on a cross, pay the penalty for sin, be raised from the dead, and offer a free gift of salvation to save us from what we did. Wow. You know, I was just listening to a debate with an atheist and a Christian, and he, the atheist was saying, how could a loving God put people in hell? That's not a loving God, hell forever. Excuse me. It's not God's fault that people are in hell. It's our fault because we told God we didn't want him. You know what God did? He stepped into history to rescue us from what we did. Wow, what a difference when you understand that. You know, people, we should be Noah's today. We should be like Noah, preachers of righteousness. We've got the same message Noah had. Oh, but you know what? We've even, we've even got more than what Noah had. We have evidence the flood has occurred. We've got billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. We should be out there saying, people, there has been a flood. God's word's true. Look at it all. You're standing on the graveyard. What a warning. God's word also says there's another judgment coming next, by fire, next time by fire, but he's provided an ark of salvation for us. The Lord Jesus comes through the doorway to be saved. But you know why many don't hear it? Because they've been indoctrinated in millions of years. Never was a global flood. God's word is not true. I want to ask a question. Are your kids and grandkids going to be on the ark of salvation or are they already gone? Because we didn't take a stand on the authority of the word of God. We didn't teach them how to defend their faith. We taught them Bible stories. We imposed Christianity from the top down. We told them what marriage is all about. But did you teach them why? Did you stand on the authority without compromise? And I have a challenge for us. Dads, have we really taken on our spiritual headship and really taught our children and led our wife and family as we should have? Or do we need to repent before a holy God? Young people, are there many of you who you thought that because of what you taught at school, you, you can't believe the Bible, and you start to recognize, wait a minute, you, you mean the Bible's true? Yes, it's history's true. That's why the gospel based in that history is true. And then the challenge for any, every one of us is, are you in the Ark of Salvation? I want to end with a 90-second video clip from our museum as a challenge to us. As the door of the Ark closed, one day that door is going to close on this earth. 
What were the people thinking outside the ark? My question to you is, are you outside the ark? Or are you in the ark? The most important thing in the whole universe for any one of us is that we can say we are in the ark of salvation, saved for eternity. As we watch this video clip, I want that to be the challenge for you. <laughs> Questions. There's a lot of those flying around, and chances are you've got a few of your own. To make things worse, it seems you can't make a move without bumping into others with the same questions. In this scientific age that supposedly disproves the Bible, it's hard to know what to believe. Wouldn't it be nice if you could find solid scientific and biblical answers? That's exactly what you can expect from Answers in Genesis. Not only that, we have something for everyone, from kids to adults, whether it's conferences, the website, radio, books, DVDs, curriculum, or the Answers magazine, the goal remains the same, to give you answers from the Bible and science beginning in Genesis. As a matter of fact, we're so dedicated to these answers, we built a 70,000 square foot creation museum to point you in one direction, to show why the Bible's history and gospel based in that history is true. The Bible's history will come to life as you encounter 160 exhibits, theaters, and a breathtaking planetarium. So, if you find yourself searching for answers in today's skeptical world, check us out and prepare to believe.